So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about oceans, uh, their amazing ecosystems, the benefits these provide to us, and the direct connection between oceans and US economic and national security. Last year, I descended uh, into deep waters off the Honduran island of Roatan in the Caribbean in this small homemade yellow submarine. At 300 feet depth, light becomes sparse, and at 700 feet, it's total darkness. We eventually reach the bottom at around 2,000 feet depth. In this alien, dark, and extreme pressure environment, we saw strange life forms, translucent fish, phosphorescent pyrosomes, deep sea corals. And when observing these unfamiliar creatures from the confines of, a, of a, this small vessel, and it's really small and uncomfortable, um, <coughs> Uh, I realize that this is actually what life is like in most of the livable space on our planet. Although 2,000 feet seemed pretty deep at the time, it's actually only a sixth of the average depth of the world's oceans. It's a world that most people will never see, uh, but it's one that can provide us with ample benefits if we take care of it and manage it properly. To give you some ideas, oceans and tiny microscopic plankton generate more than 50% of the oxygen we breathe. Over 1 billion people get essential nutrition from fish. And this includes nutrients critical to neonatal development. In a recent study published in the journal Lancet of 11 mothers, mothers who ate no fish had a 50% uh, greater probability of having children with lower IQ levels. Coastal wetlands and coral reefs protect our coasts against the impact from storms. It's been estimated that the loss of coastal wetlands can increase the destruction from severe storms with over 60%. The value of coastal protection from wetlands and coral reefs in the United States has been estimated to $53 billion per year. Ample benefits from the oceans. Ocean shipping make up 75% in volume and 59% in value of global trade. So oceans are absolutely essential for our economic security. Ocean-related jobs in the US employ close to 2.6 million people in the coastal states, including through fisheries and other living uh, resources, construction, minerals, ship and boat building, tourism and recreation, and of course, transportation. In 2009, the wages of these people totaled almost $93 billion, and they contributed almost $223 billion to the gross domestic product of the United States. And these economic activities generate many indirect jobs and revenue too. For example, in the US, the economic impact of fisheries is 3.5 times greater than the value of the fish that's actually caught and landed on shore. Also, the U.S. has the largest exclusive economic zone in the world and therefore benefits more than any other country uh, from the oceans and has a greater stake in their sound management than uh, many other countries. Unfortunately, all is not well under the, the blue uh, and deceptively uh, peaceful ocean surface. Overfishing, pollution, habitat destruction and invasive species are taking a toll on marico marine ecosystems and resulting in collapsing fish stocks, dead zones, and loss of life-giving nursery habitats, all of which, of course, have impacts on people. And this brings us to the direct connection between ocean management and US economic and national security. In 2010, 86% of the seafood consumed in the United States was imported, with the top countries being China, Thailand, Canada, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Ecuador. Top species imported include shrimp, tuna, salmon, groundfish, crabs, and squid, all of which I'm sure uh, you, you have been enjoying or will enjoy this year. Um, and U.S. companies' ability, and we're going to hear more uh, about this later from, from Ian of Darden Restaurants, U.S. companies' ability to source sustainable seafood depends on fisheries being well managed in the countries which are the source for the U.S. seafood supply chains. Worldwide, illegal and unreported fishing is responsible for catching 24 to 
57 billion pounds of fish each year, valued at between 10 and 23 and a half billion dollars, and representing 12 to 29 percent of the documented global wild fisheries catch. Illegal fishing vessels do not comply with regulations and therefore have an unfair competitive advantage uh, to those, including US companies and fishers, who play by the rules. Perhaps even more disturbing, illegal fishing contributes to overfishing, resulting in declining and collapsing fish stocks with consequences for both supply chains and national security. Worldwide, poor fisheries management mean that 31% of global fish stocks are overfished, depleted or collapsed, and 53%, another 53%, are already fully exploited. It's been estimated that the global loss from poor fisheries management worldwide might be of the order of $50 billion a year. In some extreme cases, when illegal fishing goes unchecked and local fish stocks collapse, impoverished coastal dwellers turn to illegal activities. Take the case of Somalia, uh, where it documented, it's been documented that a contributing factor to the increased piracy in recent years was the overfishing in Somalia by foreign fishing fleets. With collapsing fish stocks and declining catch, some fishers turn to piracy as a more lucrative uh, pursuit. And although Somalia, of course, represents the worst case scenario, many coastal nations with growing populations and declining fish stocks will see increased competition for scarcer resources in the future, especially as we go from 7 billion people on the planet today to 9 billion people by 2050, of which an estimated 5 billion of us will make up the middle class. A wealthier and a more urban population wants a more protein-rich diet, and much of that will have to come from wild-caught and farmed seafood. So how do we chart a course through the stormy seas of declining ocean health and increasing demand? How do we ensure economic and national security benefits from sustainably managed oceans? Well, fortunately, we know that there are a number of solutions to poor ocean governance and management, and in many places, international marine conservation is making a difference. Efforts to put in place marine protected areas, rights-based fisheries management, fisheries improvement projects, and sustainable seafood certification, such as through the Marine Stewardship Council, are incentivizing sustainable fisheries in many places around the world, including the countries from which the US sources much of its seafood. Several of these international marine conservation initiatives are supported by the Global Environment Facility and U.S. foreign assistance, including through the USAID. Soon, the effectiveness of these and other solutions can be measured by an ocean health index. Like the Dow Jones measures the health of the stock market, the ocean health index will measure the health of our oceans and how well they're able to sustainably provide the benefits we expect. Seafood, clean waters, jobs and livelihoods, and seven other categories of benefits. And, as we've seen, these benefits are directly connected to our economic and national security. The Ocean Health Index is a collaborative uh, analysis undertaken by Conservation International, New England Aquarium, the National Geographic Society, University of California at Santa Barbara, and the University of British Columbia. And it receives generous financial support from Bo and Heather Wrigley, the Pacific Life Foundation, Darden Restaurants, and several other donors. And we expect to launch the first Ocean Health Index later this year, and we hope to come back to uh, brief you on the detailed results of the first Ocean Health Index score uh, after the uh, launch, especially those of you who are from coastal states for which higher uh, resolution scores will be developed, including California and the states uh, bordering the Mid-Atlantic Bight on the East Coast. So to conclude, investments in solutions that ensure sustainable fisheries and aquaculture mean increased food security and more sustainable supply chains for U.S. corporations but also less instability requiring U.S. civilian and military engagements. So sound ocean management, both domestically and abroad, benefit both the economic and national security of the United States and its people. So thank you very much for uh, listening to these comments. If you have any uh, questions uh, or are interested in more information, uh, I think my email address should be up there now. Uh, or you can also contact my colleague, Jill Siegel, uh, who is here and who does the US uh, government uh, relations work for, for Conservation International. Thank you very much. OK, that was wonderful. Um, now we'll hear from uh, one of Conservation International's uh, big partners, uh, Darden uh, Seafoods, or 
Um, Ian Olson, who's the director of uh, sustainability at, at Darden. Uh, Darden is uh, well known to many of you. If you, it's the largest, I believe, um, um, in store numbers, uh, um, casual dining um, company in the world. So uh, it's enormous. Um, and if you've ever been to an Olive Garden or a Capitol Grill or a Red Lobster, um, you uh, you've been uh, to a Darden uh, restaurant. So Ian. Um, <laughs> Please come up here. I like taking the alternative routes here, but um, John, thank you for that introduction. Um, I was going to say, usually I start off my presentations kind of giving you an idea of what Darden is, because quite frankly, five years ago when I came to Darden, I wasn't sure what Darden was, but I'm sure I have my uh, Vice President of Government Affairs, Chip Cunday, here, who I know has done a great job explaining to you everything about Darden restaurants, so I'm not sure that I have to go through everything, but um, to follow up on that, Darden is the uh, largest full-service restaurant company in the world. We're about $8 billion in revenues, um, 1,800 restaurants, mainly in the U.S. Uh, the brands include, as John mentioned, uh, Olive Garden, Red Lobster, uh, Longhorn Steakhouse, Capitol Grill, Seasons 52, Bahama Breeze, and now Eddie V's. So we have seven brands in the family. Um, but more importantly, particularly around sustainability, we have 180,000 employees, which makes us the 29th largest employer in the United States. The important thing about that from a sustainability perspective, at least for me, is 70% of those employees are under the age of 30. They fall into that millennial category. And they are really the proxy when we look at what we're trying to do around sustainability for a lot of business reasons. But if I had to pick a stakeholder group that's most important for us, it's our employee base. Um, this is very top of mind for them and we're, we're um, really excited about getting them engaged in this and getting their perspectives. Uh, because we really feel it's important to have the best employees uh, in the workplace. So I've been asked to, to kind of talk about what I would consider the most complex sustainability issue that I've ever worked on, which is uh, sustainable fisheries. I, I say it's complex because it's, it, there are so many different factors involved. Um, as my friends from the New England Aquarium advise me almost every day for the last five years, um, there is no silver, silver bullet, there is no one answer, there is no simplistic way of looking at this. Um, but it is one of the most fascinating issues that, that we're working on as a restaurant company. Um, and I, I want to share just a, a little perspective in terms of how we're looking at it and why we're looking at it and why it's so important. Um, because we are working on a lot of different issues around energy, water, waste, uh, particularly in our restaurants and our supply chain. Um, but this one is, is really um, um, important for us, particularly because we are one of the biggest seafood buyers in the world. Uh, with Red Lobster, um, it, it allows us that opportunity to, to have an impact on the fisheries. And this is just one small portion of the overall equation as Sebastian was talking about earlier uh, with the oceans, because there's a lot of different industries, a lot of different players in there. So this is just one, one perspective. If I look at, there's a couple factors I, I would like to raise um, that I think are particularly important when we're talking about sustainable fisheries. One is, and Sebastian touched on, this basic supply demand issue. We have 7 billion people today, 9 billion by, by 2050. Uh, I was reading a study by KPMG um, that they just released. It was about externalities being part of uh, natural resources as externalities being part of the business model, whether it be food production or energy or transportation. And they talked about that food production by 2032 will have to go up 100% in developing countries and throughout the world 70%. So this competition that we're starting to see right now of emerging markets, taste changing, moving to more proteins and vegetable based, um, We've got this major supply demand shift curve happening. Um, tastes are changing. It is going to put enormous pressure on the oceans. Uh, for the last 20 years, really seafood demand has been made up by aquaculture at the end of the day. If you look at demand for seafood and what has been coming out of the oceans for the last 20 years, 
wild fisheries have, have been basically flat for the last 20 years while that gap has been made up by aquaculture for the most part. Um, and most of it coming um, um, sourced from other places. This is one of those issues that we're going to have to address is how are we going to get our seafood going forward right now because as the world gets bigger, just more and more consumption, more and more demand. I'd also like to add too that what's going to make it even more complex is what I call the competition of proteins. As you heard earlier, we're a, a multifaceted branded company. Um, we have steakhouses, we have seafood, we have Italian, and we have a uh, 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 Mediterranean. When I talk about, we have to look at it from, from a very high 50,000 foot view, if you will, of, of when we look at our supply chains and look at proteins. And when you look at proteins, for the most part, the science will tell you that land-based proteins are not as good of converters of basically vegetable calories into end protein calories. If you look at poultry or beef, and you look at what it takes to produce one pound of beef or one pound of, of end poultry versus seafood. Seafood is a much better converter of those vegetable calories uh, at the end of the day. Now, there's a lot of work going on right now to look at land-based proteins. Um, just last week, um, uh, the Walmart and McDonald's just formalized their Sustainable Beef Coalition, so they're going to be working on beef, and there's a lot of work that dairy and, and poultry has been doing. But until that the, the, those equations either even up or, or um, somewhat come down significantly, we're going to be, uh, oceans are going to face even more and more pressure because at the end of the day for us, natural resources, that is what sustainability is about. Um, colleague of mine, Jason Clay at WWF has, has said it before and I, I'll use it again, but you know, we basically have to double the, the production of food in the next, what, 20, 30 years, but don't do it with any more natural resources because we don't have any more. Um, and that's gonna be the big, big challenges as we as a restaurant company and food company look at these issues, um, how we're gonna look at the oceans and how we're gonna strategize and, and, and make sure the oceans are a big part of our business and make sure that it continues to allow us to grow as a business. So what can we do? Um, we kind of try to stage it in three phase, phases. I'll talk about three phases. One's engagement, the other's education, and the other's enhancements. When I talk about engagement, I, I come back to the, the concept of there is no single answer, there is no silver bullet, but there's a lot of different perspectives. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to make sure that we all engage um, other stakeholder groups. For us, it includes NGOs or government officials, or industry groups, fishing communities, suppliers, academics. It can be cumbersome at times, I'm not going to lie, but, but at the end of the day, you have to get different perspectives as you sit there and try to figure out what your strategy is going to be. So I, I think you know, it, it's a constant learning process, um, and I think that engagement piece to help raise your awareness of different perspectives or what unintended consequences might bring is, is incredibly important. Around education, um, at Darden, what we've been doing is working with the New England Aquarium. We've created a, a seafood sustainability or a, a sustainable fisheries dashboard is what we call it. Um, people accuse me of being a little slant towards automotive since I worked towards Ford, at Ford for nine years. But um, we've been using this as an education tool, not only for our buyers, um, but frankly for um, the New England Aquarium itself. Um, these conversations are two-way conversations. Um, and we feel that it's incredibly important for our partners, whether it be NGOs or academics or, or government partners, uh, to understand some of the business impacts that we have as well and some of the considerations that we're looking at because we all have our own filter and lens through this, but it's been an incredible education tool for us um, and we'll continue to use it because uh, we want it to be embedded in what we're doing when we're buying seafood. This is part of the consideration set as we move forward not only is quality and delivery and price one of those things, but sustainability is right there in terms of the consideration set. Um, the other, the other uh, education tool I'd bring up is the Ocean Health Index that, that Sebastian uh, mentioned. And we're funding, um, helping, to, helping to support. I, I think this is really going to be a great tool, uh, one I would highly recommend when it comes out that you take the time to look at it. Um, in that as I mentioned before, this is a very complex issue, and I think sometimes we oversimplify 
solutions. But I think this tool is going to help simplify it, but not oversimplify it, but yet make it digestible. In other words, you can get your arms around it and try to find some actions out of it and prioritize what you're looking at. Um, so we're excited um, to see the release. And I would say, again, if, if you have a chance, make sure that you see that when it does come out. And finally, enhancements. Um, there was some discussion around fishery improvement projects. We are big believers in fishery improvement projects. Um, the way I kind of classify them is, you know, when you work in the field of sustainability, a lot of people will tell you, um, you know, just don't do this, do this, don't do that, do this. This is the prohibited list. This is the good list, right? And as one of my, my colleagues in a prior life had told me, you know, it's kind of hard to wake up every morning trying to, you know, get out of bed and say, you know what, I'm going to do less bad today. I'm, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do less bad, and this is the way I'm going to get stuff done. And I think the Fishery Improvement Project kind of shifts that model and says we're going to do more good. There's a lot of stuff that we do have to look at in terms of the less bad part of the equation, um, in terms of what fish not to serve or things not to, gear not to use, things of that nature. But I think there's, there's been a lost art around that more good part, and that's what Fishery Improvement Projects are for us. Um, we have launched through the Clinton Global Initiative um, and in partnership with Sustainable Fisheries Partnership and with public supermarkets, um, a commitment to uh, do three fishery improvement projects around the world. We've launched one in the Gulf of Mexico um, with Snapper, um, and right now we're investigating the other two. But the, the great thing about this is that it's engaging communities, it's engaging the supply base, it's engaging a lot of different players, and we're actually really excited about it in terms of helping that stock um, recover and make sure that we have good data to actually measure the stock uh, of that fishery going forward because there will be a lot of stress put on that stock. So with that, I, I think I, I would just conclude by saying um, when we're looking at, at at seafood or, or, or sustainable fisheries, this is going to be a critical piece. It's a critical piece for us as we look to continue to grow as, as a company. Um, and I think you know, there are so many complexities to it, so many um, pressures that are going to be brought to bear on it that we hope that we can work in partnership, continue to work in partnership with folks like the New England Aquarium and Conservation International, but others as well, um, to really help try to find solutions to make sure that the oceans uh, aren't depleted. So thank you very much. I think we'll uh, try to take some questions. We always try to get everybody out of here if they want to leave at about 1.15, and I think we're about five minutes away from that. So if we have any uh, questions, we can take them now, or people can stay afterwards and chit-chat with our guests and other people. Um, Sebastian, Ian, or over there. Um, do you have any uh, questions that uh, people might have either for Sebastian or Ian or myself they'd like to ask? Ian, you want to come up and just yeah. restate the question, maybe? Sorry. I think we had a microphone that I probably lost along the way. Uh, there it is. Well, now we have, okay, you can use that. I think the question was about the statement I had around proteins. And it's, I think what we're looking at, and you were talking about the conversion question. When we look at, at, at things like water or feed or things like that, that you need to raise protein, right? Whether it be um, poultry, um, whether, whether it be um, beef, whether it you know, be uh, a fish, when you look at it from a feed standpoint and a water standpoint, those three, when you line them up, fish is actually requires less feed, if you will, or less input from a water standpoint and or a feed standpoint than, say, um, poultry or beef. Part of it is just physics. Um, I mean, because at the end of the day, fish are basically supported in water and don't use up as much energy as they grow in their life scale. So it's, that's part of it. Um, but I think what we're going to find and what you know, folks like the Sustainable Beef Coalition are looking at and things like that are 
how do we look at that front end of the equation and use less natural resources to still produce beef or poultry or dairy? <clears throat> Any other questions? Anne Marie. Yeah, I, I, I think when you're looking at certification, I truly believe it depends on your business model um, is part of it um, in terms of what you're trying to accomplish or what you're trying to communicate. So for example, in Europe, um, MSC is important because it, it's a communication tool to the consumer at the end of the day, especially in retail right now. Um, for us, uh, right now, we have focused on the business-to-business -business portion of it in terms of making sure whether it's GAA or MSC or, or whatever the case may be, we buy product that's certified product and that's part of our evaluation process, but it isn't necessarily communicated out to, to the guest or the consumer. Because frankly, if, if we took you know some of our menu items and started putting certifications on for everything that we use, the menu would be enormous. I mean, you could take a salad and it would probably take up one page probably of all the different certifications that you have. So our business model is a little different than say retail or, or some of the other um, uh, things. But I think certifications, um, the most important thing about certification I could say right now that I personally feel that we need to do a better job as a community around seafood is engaging those that are getting certified, i.e. the suppliers making sure they know how to implement this stuff and they aren't in the business of just checking the box and certifying, yep, here it is, here it is. We're in the business of trying to just certify to every other standard. I think we need to do a better job of trying to figure out how do we find some harmonization, how do we find some standardization. So at the end of the day, they're implementing sustainability, not trying to pass an audit around sustainability. So I think that's a big, big room of improvement for us. Any other questions here? Well, if you all like to uh, um, give our presenters a round of applause. <laughs> I, think, I think we can all appreciate, and of course, as ICCF now is working with this program uh, of oceans, uh, there's a lot of complexity to these, to these issues, and there are a lot of stakeholders, and there's a lot of important stuff we need to get out of our oceans. Uh, whether it be protein or energy, um, and uh, we we look forward to working with a variety of different stakeholders in this room. But I really encourage congressional offices uh, specifically to come and uh, talk to us about some of the things that they've been uh, hearing about from various constituents in in their areas, or uh, if they've got ideas um, that they'd like to uh, to present and. Uh, discuss with us so we can uh, help better um, navigate our way <laughs> through um, uh, these issues. So thank you very much. Um, it's great to see a lot of you and uh, again and a lot of new faces.